the propaganda, the disinformation that has been routinely dispensed by Monsanto and its allies has had a major effect. That's why the mainstream media now is awash in stories of how safe GMOs are and how utterly out to lunch those of us with concerns are. That's based on disinformation and people not even understanding the facts. It's the dream of helping the most vulnerable sectors of our society, the children and the lactating mothers who are not reached by the current interventions in place. We never say that golden rice is the silver bullet. We're saying that, vi that golden rice can be and will be an added tool in our toolbox to complement the existing interventions, which are you eat a diverse diet, breastfeeding, fortification. While all these interventions are working, cannot be denied that still sectors of the society are not reached by these interventions. And considering that we eat a lot of rice, we will be complementing these current efforts. So our plant breeders now are better equipped with tools that can help develop better varieties. These tools were not available during the times of my professors because science is evolving. New tools are coming in and it is our responsibility to use these tools in our breeding work. Now with today's advance in science, you can even direct where you, your gene will go. This is not available during my time, but it's available now. So we harness available tools to develop better products. These are my takeaway messages. Number one, golden rice can be a complementary tool to existing intervention to alleviate vitamin A deficiency. Number two, it will only be released if it has received all approvals and it matches the farmer expectations in terms of yield and consumer preference. And third, any decision should be made on science, not based on fear. So I, I've been involved in a project for um, a little more than 10 years developing, um, trying to understand the genetic basis of flood tolerance. Many farmers in South and Southeast Asia grow rice in flood prone zones. And this is problematic because the floods come sporadically and they're, they're increasing in intensity and duration, likely because of the effects of, of climate change. Uh, and so these are very uh, poor farmers. Generally, they are growing only enough food to feed themselves and their family. And so a big focus of um, genetic improvement and, and agricultural improvement is to develop seeds that will be useful for farmers in less developed countries. 
my collaborators at the International Rice Research Institute developed a variety, several varieties of rice that are tolerant of flooding, so they can withstand floods for two weeks, and most rice varieties will die within three days. Uh, it's been very important for farmers. They're harvesting three to five-fold more rice after floods. So this is a genetic technology called marker-assisted breeding, and I think it's been very important for farmers in those areas. I think there's a, you hear there's um, concerns about so-called GMOs, and I think part of the problem is the, the terminology in the conversation, because there is no such thing as, we, we can't sort of categorize all GMOs uh, together. There are many different types of genetically improved crops. Everything we eat has been genetically improved using some kind of um, artificial method. In fact, it's often called artificial selection. And so I think um, what's, what's really important is to advance the goals of sustainable agriculture using whatever technology happens to be appropriate. And usually it's going to be a combination of technologies. Yeah, you know, there is a lot of misinformation and um, it's, it's really difficult for consumers. Um, maybe they're not familiar with um, the scientific consensus about the use of genetic technologies. Um, so every major scientific organization in the world has concluded that the process of genetic engineering is no more risky than other types of uh, conventional uh, breeding technologies. And um, so the focus really is to look at um, what are the results. Can we enhance food security? Can we enhance sustainable agriculture? Um, and so uh, I think the messaging is there's a lot of uh, messaging for marketing. And I understand that these are large companies, whether they're an organic company or another, they want to sell their product. But I think it becomes very problematic when um, misinformation is, is passed out that are, that are scaring people. And of course, we, we've seen this with many other types of scientific issues. We, we've seen it with climate change. So, um, and it's, it's very kind of tribal. So there, if you, many Republicans will um, push back, reject the science on climate change because that's what their tribe has decided to do. And um, then on the left, we see this uh, rejections of, of vaccines because of misinformation from movie stars and that's creating epidemics in some uh, very wealthy communities um, and very, very frightened people. So they're very scared. They've heard, they really believe there is a huge risk if they're vaccinated that their child will have some disease and there's no scientific evidence for that. And of course it, it's harmful if the child is not vaccinated, they could be infected with a deadly disease. And so um, that's also very tribal. Um, certain communities, whole communities, will um, have this idea that vaccines should not be used. And it's the same, um, in my mind, the exact same situation with plant genetics. And it's more difficult with plant genetics and farming because less than something less than 1% of people in the United States are farmers, even fewer are um, biologists. And so um, there is, there's been a lot of fear promoted on various websites. And I think consumers don't know that they can go to the National Academy of Sciences or um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and um, really look at the scientific consensus. And I, I think that is um, really an important aspect of my job and other scientists to really bridge that gap between um, what where to help consumers know where to go for accurate information and to reduce the fear and um, try to use appropriate technologies to advance uh, sustainable agriculture and food security. I think many see the organic movement as being a reaction to the industrialization of agriculture. And I think that's certainly true, although I think that the organic movement really came from so many different threads, it's really hard to divine what its ultimate origin is. But certainly 
consumers who were looking for organics and growers who started identifying themselves as orga- organic growers inherently saw some sort of critique of industrial agriculture that, that they were supposed to improve upon. This is what makes organics what it is today is it's the way it's regulated. Um, that organics, unlike natural or now there's new word clean or real or even local, has a very, organic has a very specific set of meanings that have been developed and codified over time. Um, and the, all the institutions that help support those meanings have developed over time. And it's very, unlike almost any other kind of thing you could ascribe to a type of food. Okay. So at what point there was so much, um, dynamism in the organic market that a lot of folks wanted to have the federal government involved in part because different states had different laws different st- certifiers didn't ha- had different laws and some of these people wanted to ship internationally and different countries had different standards and rules or or had none at all so they wanted to kind of regularize it um and so but a lot of growers didn't agree with it a lot of the people in the organic community didn't agree with it but you know, it was the kind of the big players that went ahead and pushed for the federal involvement. And the federal, at first the federal government was, you know, they, they wanted nothing to do with it. And in part, they didn't want to disparage the rest of the food supply. But at some point they realized that this was um, a dynamic and growing market um, and really the fastest growing market in foods and that they really had to, to support their clientele, and so they agreed to have a federal standard. So Congress passed a law in 1990 that just had the basic stipulation that there will that will have a national law over organics. And then it took um, over 10 years, if I recall, for the the federal government to come up with a specific set of rules of what organic would be at the national level. And when they first came out with the rules, they came up with like a list of like over 70 inputs and practices that organic growers completely shunned. Three of them were the use of irradiation, the the allowability of GMOs in organics, and sewage sludge. The folks behind GMOs originally imagined that their the genetically modified organisms would be a um, sustainable replacement for pesticides that's how they still market it they say well we we think we're part of the solution not part of the problem right that's how they position themselves that they're helping to solve the problem so they i think there were some that were kind of taken aback that the organic community so roundly rejected gmos but you know other you know it depends if you want to give it a more cynical read or not hundreds of thousands of comments to the Federal Register and eventually the federal government reversed on that and came up with a standard that was closer to what the organic community was actually practicing. Regulators realized that if consumers were so opposed to this that it wasn't going to have meaning and it wasn't going to accomplish what they set out to accomplish, which is to kind of create this other niche market. That, you know, it, it, had to, it had to have meaning. And even like the big producers that were behind the federal government recognize that if, if it's not a meaningful difference with conventional agriculture, it's going to blow out our market. I mean, I mean, people read these fights as like having it organic be completely undermined. And it's, it's again, less ideal than the, the, than the agroecological standards that a lot of growers aspire to. But it's not completely meaningless or else people wouldn't buy it. And, and the big producers that were, you know, kind of leading the pack knew that. It allowed growers who were interested to get into organics for various reasons to do so. And then it also, the, the, the effect that no one expected is that growers that, who might have been um, abiding by those standards but didn't want to go through that hassle or had great relationship with their customers if customers didn't bel- didn't need certification just dropped out of organics and so organic has come to be more like um i don't want to say middle of the road but I, it's more um it, it's uh, it's not a standard that assures purity a, a standards that assures like some sort of minimum that you that you meet these standards and so as the, as more and more conventional producers got involved in organics, um, some of the original organic growers felt left out or lost out. They lost out on some of their markets, and some folks wanted to go beyond organic. And then and that created all these contradictions because in these guys that were like had moved into organics because for 
for reasons because of the market or whatever were told well you know they didn't feel like they were welcome and they that was very confusing for them because they felt that well you know you guys wanted us to convert to organics and now you know now you don't really want us to convert because it's hurting your markets and so when you certify organic what you're doing is you're saying that i agree to abide by this set of standards and in return for that standard for to, in, in return for abiding by that standard i expect to be rewarded in the marketplace because people will know that i have i'm i'm an organic farmer and they'll pay for it my concern was is just with the contradiction of a label as a way of moving a broader swath of farming and food production to a better way People the world over, this is one of the few psychological universals that's been identified, have a tendency to imagine that there are underlying hidden forces that make the world the way that it is, the way that it appears. And we call these essences. And that they're sort of intrinsic inside objects that, uh, uh, that somehow it seems magically gives gives rise to those objects and that's what makes a dog different from a cat is somehow it's these invisible essences that that, um, that people perceive to exist and more recently there's a new placeholder that people are um, that seems to capture people's intuitions about essences which is our genes um, our genes are not the same thing as essences but they share quite a few properties with essences. So one, we think of our genes as uh, having an immutable, that they're immutable, that you, um, you can't avoid uh, a particular outcome to the extent that you have uh, a gene associated with out that outcome. Also, we think of genes as natural, and we think of essences as natural, and, uh, and so that we think that's the way they are, are meant to be, and when people talk about what's natural, they often fall for what we call the naturalistic fallacy and they equate what is natural with good. Uh, also that we think of uh, genes like essences as dividing up the world into categories. So we talk about um, essences as, say, it carves nature at its joints. It's what distinguishes, a, you know, a, a rabbit from a kangaroo. You know, they can kind of look sort of similar but we know no they're they, they share they're, they're different deep down what the way they're different deep down is that they're they're different in their genes and and we think that they're different in their essences so i i think essences are relevant to gmo foods in um in a couple of these what we call essentialist biases that people have one is that we think of um uh genes as being natural and so the genes that exist in products that grow in the natural world we think of as their default natural state um, and the way they're meant to be and that uh, if you've now modified the genome to change those products um, many people would view this as deeply unnatural then and if it's unnatural then it, and it must be um, bad and, and, and threatening in some way and so some of the kinds of uh, arguments that people bring that are consistent with that and and I should emphasize, I think there's lots of other kinds of arguments people can make against GMO that don't involve this idea about essences. And I find many of these arguments quite compelling. I'd, not that I'm going to say that GMO products are, are good in, in, in every way. But I do think that this one concern that people have with them is that it's unnatural, um, is, uh, well, reflecting on people's tendency to view essences as underlying food. One response that people have then is that, well, this is unnatural a gmo tomato is not the same as a tomato in the wild and this is unnatural because it's unnatural uh it's bothersome in some ways one way that it's bothersome is that it uh, seems that humans are doing things that humans aren't meant to that uh, messing with the uh the natural world i think many people would say messing with with god's creations so actually that's what some activists say gmo stands for god move over um you know we uh humans are are, are taking charge and i think that's a a bothersome idea to uh to many and uh another uh bothersome idea with gmo is where the genes come from and um there are two kinds of genetic modifications that occur. One 
are, are called um, cisgenic modifications. And that's when, uh, say if you're talking with tomatoes, you get a, a gene from a related species, another kind of tomato, another varietal, and um, bring that uh, into the tomato that you are uh, modifying its genome. People generally aren't so bothered by that because that's not crossing our perceived boundaries of essences. It's still a tomato gene. This is just a new tomato gene in this tomato. People aren't so bothered by that. Where they get more bothered is if the gene comes from a different species. For instance, a, a tomato once was uh, grown that had a gene from a, uh, an arctic flounder, um, which is a fish, which, uh, which was chosen because this gene helps the fish's blood not freeze in the arctic waters. Thinking maybe this would have the same benefit with tomatoes so that tomatoes wouldn't freeze on the field. It turns out it didn't work out. Um, uh, however, it's uh, this idea is, is quite bothersome to many people that um, this now is somehow a cross of these essences, a tomato essence and a fish essence together sounds like an abomination. Uh, one survey found that uh, about half the people imagine this tomato is going to taste fishy. It would be a fishy tasting tomato because it has essence of fish in it. One aspect I think that is not appreciated that well is that our genes are, are shared with um, many other organisms. We, we share uh, about 20% of our genes with yeast. We share 90 something percent of our genes with mice. Like our, our, gene, our genes aren't only part of humans, we're sort of reflecting our long evolution uh, across time that uh, genes that serve certain functions are preserved in our genome from far distant species. So we actually do have genes of we share genes with tomatoes. We share genes with Arctic flounder that we, we already do. Um, and it's because these genes are not essences of Arctic flounder, essences of human. They're, a gene makes a protein that does something in our body. And we share a lot of those same proteins across the, uh, uh, the natural world. So research finds that um, if you look at GMO opponents, and there's many GMO opponents, and there's many reasons that, that people are opposed to, to GMO products, but uh, about 70% of opponents um, uh, appear to have opposition with, with GMOs. That's consistent with what we would call an absolute moral uh, violation. That means uh, uh, it is people view it as inherently wrong, and regardless of um, costs and benefits actually aren't weighed much in these decisions and you can see evidence of this because you can tell people well imagine that this product would have this other benefit would that change how you feel and if and if people's responses are unaffected by any sort of costs or benefits that you suggest that that suggests that it's not a moral decision based on weighing costs and benefits it's a moral decision uh, based uh, somewhat on viewing this as just a uh, inherently uh, wrong. And so surveys find it's about 70% of GMO opponents have that as the, their core feeling of uh, opposition to GMO products is, is tied up with this absolute moral uh, value. There aren't any significant food crops for direct human consumption that are legal to plant in, in a GMO form uh, anywhere, with very, very few exceptions. It's now legal to plant a GMO BT eggplant in Bangladesh. It's legal to plant GMO white maize in the Republic of South Africa. Um, but that's about it. Um, food crops for direct human consumption like wheat or rice or potato haven't been commercialized in a GMO form uh, in more than just one or two countries around the world. They haven't been commercialized in the United States. When it gets to animal feed crops like maize or soybeans, those are more widely uh, commercialized. And when it comes to industrial crops like cotton, uh, they're still more uh, frequent adaptations and adoptions of, of those crops. But even for an industrial crop like cotton, if you go to the continent of Africa, there's only one country in all of tropical Africa that has yet made it legal for farmers to plant GMO cotton. That's Burkina Faso. So the, the uptake of this technology has been heavily constrained 
particularly for food crops, but uh, even in some cases for industrial crops. In the United States and in Canada and in other industrial countries, the technology has been developed mostly by private companies. And in those countries, the United States and Canada, for example, uh, the technology can be patented and can be uh, sold as a proprietary technology. Uh, in developing countries, it's completely different. Uh, the technology is often being developed by public sector institutions, not by private companies. And in nearly all of the developing world, it's not legal to make a patent claim on, on a plant. Uh, so in developing countries, it's easy to imagine that the technology is going to be dominated by private companies because that's what happens in the United States. But that's an inappropriate assumption for developing countries where the technology is often available free of charge. In rich countries, uh, we've used uh, the ability to make patent claims as one incentive for private companies to develop new applications of biotechnology. Historically, there hasn't been a lot of private investment in the development of new seeds because seeds copy themselves. It's very hard for companies to recover their investment. Um, one exception has always been hybrid crops, like hybrid maize, where the benefits of crop improvement can't be captured by replanting the seed. You have to go back to the hybrid seed company and buy uh, a, new, uh, a new year's supply of hybrid seeds. And so there have been large private investments in hybrid maize, for example, and that's one reason hybrid maize yields have gone up so rapidly. When it comes to GMO crops, what uh, what the advocates for patent protection say is that, well, if we, if we allow companies to patent a GMO variety of an openly pollinated non-hybrid crop, well, it'll, it'll bring in as much private investment as, as hybridization did, and that's going to be good for, for innovation. If you look at what is holding back biotechnology in Africa, it's a, a set of very strict regulations that make it illegal for farmers to plant GMO crops. Now, where did those regulations come from? They came from uh, European NGOs like uh, Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, which have campaigned in Africa to convince African governments to adopt the same very strict regulatory systems that are found in Europe. Those systems in Europe haven't allowed the commercialization of any GMO crops. And so when African countries embrace this same European style regulatory system, they don't approve any GMO crops either. So in a sense, the, the modern uh, European influence on Africa isn't the traditional colonial relationship. It's to some extent a neo-colonial relationship where Europeans are no longer imposing direct political control, but European-based NGOs are ventriloquizing onto African governments European-style regulatory systems. Well, uh, right now uh, on the shelf, uh, there are varieties of, of cotton and, and maize uh, that uh, are genetically engineered to, to protect against insects without the need for insecticide sprays. So African governments could approve Bt cotton or, or Bt maize and grow those crops with reduced insect damage. Uh, that would be good for the income of farmers, it would be good for the yield of the crops, it would be good for the protection of the environment. And these are technologies that are that are already available. Uh, but as I've said, in tropical Africa, the only country to approve uh, any GMO crops at all is Burkina Faso, and they've approved BT cotton, but no one else so far has, has followed suit. I, I wrote a book about these problems in 2008. I was uh, discouraged at the time that Burkina Faso was the only country to have approved BT cotton. Um, a little more discouraged now that in the seven years that have that have passed, no country has followed Burkina Faso, and BT cotton is not legal to grow in in anywhere else in tropical Africa. BT cotton in in India um, 
was denied uh, approval by the government for a number of years because of active resistance by campaigners against uh, GMO crops. BT cotton had been a success in China uh, since 1997 and farmers in India wanted BT cotton because they knew it would allow them to protect against cotton bollworm pests without having to spray so many insecticides. Uh, but the government uh, didn't approve BT cotton uh, because of campaigns against GMOs. It, it finally was approved only after Indian farmers uh, got their hands on GMO seeds uh, through their own initiative. These are so-called stealth seeds that um, some companies developed uh, surreptitiously. And farmers love these seeds because they protect it against insect pests. After an insect infestation, uh, some farmers that were planting these BT seeds were, they were outed because their fields were perfectly fine while everyone else's fields were destroyed by the insects. So the secret was out. Everybody knew that BT cotton was being planted already. The government tried to pull it back and force farmers to destroy those fields and stop planting the seeds, but the farmers at that point stood up and said, absolutely not, we need this technology. And so the government uh, relented and approved BT cotton, at least in some parts of India. And that was 2002, and after the government's approval of BT cotton, the technology spread very, very rapidly. And now uh, more than 90% of the cotton grown in India is, is BT cotton. It's been uh, phenomenally successful. It's boosted farmer income. It's protected farmers from exposure to toxic insecticide sprays. It's protected the environment from toxic insecticide sprays. But it remains controversial. We can't make any strong claims yet one way or the other because the technology isn't being used uh, by more than just um, a handful a, tech, you know, a relative handful of farmers in the developing world. In all of Sub-Saharan Africa, in the tropical countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, the technology is illegal to use. So we don't ha except Burkina Faso with cotton. So we don't have the evidence that's, uh, that's needed to make a reliable claim about the contribution it can make to, uh, to food security. Campaigners against GMOs like to say, oh, listen, it hasn't solved the world's food problems, it hasn't improved the lives of farmers. Well, of course it hasn't. It's not legal to use these seeds yet in most developing countries. Uh, it's frustrating to me that, um, that we're not giving farmers the choice of whether or not to try these technologies. In every country where they have been uh, given permission to plant GMO seeds, uh, farmers have done so They've done so eagerly and they've done so successfully. And adoption rates have been extremely high. That's true for uh, yellow corn in the Philippines. It's true for cotton in both China and India. It's, uh, it's true for cotton in Burkina Faso. It's true for soybeans, of course, throughout uh, Latin America. Wherever the technology has been made uh, legal to plant, Farmers have planted it uh, eagerly and with, and with technical and commercial success. But in, in most cases, it's not yet legal. And so we don't know. We don't have good inform information on how the technology could perform in the countries that need it the most, particularly in tropical Africa. Well, if you look at either the United States or Canada or European countries, these are countries where farmers are already prosperous where consumers are already well fed. In fact, most of them are, are overfed. These are countries where large corporations play a prominent role in food and, and farming systems, where farms are industrial scale, uh, deeply, uh, deeply engaged in international markets and international finance. In these countries, it's possible to imagine uh, the the role of corporations as maybe going too far, the, the drive for ever more productive agricultural practices as perhaps unnecessary, 
and I understand the the anxieties that citizens in rich countries have about the next technology in farming. But it's a mistake for citizens in rich countries to then project those anxieties into developing countries where you often can't find any multinational corporations, where technology has barely been improved at all, where farmers are not yet productive, where their yields are only one-tenth as high as in the United States or Europe, where their income is only $1.25 a day and where a third of them are chronically undernourished instead of overfed. It's, it's just a mistake to project the, the concerns that citizens in rich countries have about their environment onto environments in the developing world that are so completely different. It's really important for all of us to focus on the goals of sustainable agriculture, which is to feed the poor and malnourished, try to use less toxic inputs, conserve land and water, uh, enhance soil fertility. There's a number of very, very important issues that are increasingly important as the climate changes. I, I think a focus on how a seed was developed. Uh, what genetic technique was used is, is just a big distraction from uh, the need to uh, really get serious about food and farming and, and the environment. Thank you.